Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I love, love, love ink on paper. Even just a drop of ink on paper to me looks like, wow, that looks <laughs> really good. Just because it's so permanent and official looking. Kind of like when you first get to use a Sharpie when you're a kid. And, you know, it's like, wow, I made this dark, bold line. <laughs> Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Isaac Butler. And I'm your other host, June Thomas. June, who did we just hear extolling the virtues of ink? That was children's book author and illustrator Mika Song. Okay, last time I checked, you yourself do not have any kids, unless there's been some huge life events since you moved to Scotland. Uh, (laughs) I'm curious about what got you interested in the work of a children's book illustrator and author. And if I can just, for my own pleasure, please ask you to include the word book as frequently as possible in your answer. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Just to confirm, Isaac, I have not acquired any kids since our last episode. Uh, I first met Mika because my partner was in a writing group with her, which is how I came to attend the launch party for her first book, which she mentions in the interview. And sometimes it takes that kind of weird coincidence for us non-parents to realize how cool kids' books are. Like Mika's first book, Tea with Oliver, was about... The Joy of Writing Letters, which is just the perfect topic for a stationary lover like me. And her more recent series, which began with Donut Feed the Squirrels and has more recently included One Smart Cookie, is about some adorable Brooklyn squirrels whose energy absolutely captivates me. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I have a kid, so that is... Yes, that is... <laughs> you have an excuse. <laughs> well, right, right. And, you know, I know the classic children's books, but I didn't know the new ones. And discovering them with her, particularly when they are legitimately funny yes. uh, or legitimately adorable <laughs> and invite you to look at the world in a different way is yes. just... I, I really love those. Um, do our Slate Plus listeners have anything awaiting them this week? You know they do, Isaac. I do know they do. That's true. This question is sort of like <laughs> everyone who listens to this show knows. I'm going to be like, oh, wow. Oh, really? I'm wow. so surprised. <laughs> so blow my mind, June. What's going on for Slate Plus this week? Well, I asked Mika to tell me about three children's book series that she really enjoys. And I put her on the spot. And I have to tell you, she went straight to her daughter's bookshelves to find her answer. That is incredible. I definitely don't want to miss that. Among other things, I'm sure it features June saying the word book several (laughs) more times. And the good news is I'm a Slate Plus member, and so I won't miss it. And I have to say, even before I was a Slate podcaster, I was a Slate Plus member. I even pay for my membership. (laughs) With that membership, you get full access behind the paywall on the Mothership site. You get bonus segments on shows like this one. You get bonus full episodes of great shows like Decoder Ring, and you get to sleep better at night knowing you've done what you can to support us right here on Working. Go to slate.com slash working plus to sign up today. All right, now let's listen in on June's conversation with children's book author and illustrator Mika Song. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. Mika Song, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about your creative process. 
Hi, June. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So I'm curious how you describe the work that you do. So on my website, it says that I like to make books about funny, sweet outsiders. And my books all right now have been about, oh, no, no, that's not true. I have some books with human children in them that I've illustrated. But they all do have that in common, even if they're squirrels or raccoon or, or whatever, a cat. Yeah. Like a lot of illustrators who are also book authors, you both illustrate your own stories and collaborate with writers to bring their stories to life. So I'd like to begin by talking about your own books. I believe you've had two main series involving two sets of characters, two books involving Oliver, who's a bit of a nerdy cat, and then four with Norma and Belly, a pair of very hungry squirrels who also have some friends. First, I'd love you to tell me the origin story of both of those series. How did you find Oliver and how did you find Norma and Belly? The Tea with Oliver book is my first debut book. It's the book that I signed with my agent with. So it's a very special book to me. I mean, I got the name Oliver from the street I used to live on, on Oliver Street when I was working on it. Oh. And I based the cat character on a good friend of mine who collects tea sets. And the idea of the letters going back and forth between the mouse who's trying to trying to make a friend with this sensitive and lonely cat mm. that he lives in the same house with, but doesn't know that he exists. That idea of the letters was uh, my mother used to have a, a letter desk, you know, those ones that like fold up. Yes. And she'd always leave like tiny little scribbles on a piece of paper and throw them behind the desk. Wow. And tell me like, oh, I, I think I saw a mouse writing something down there. Um, <laughs> and I really, it really like captured my imagination. And I would like, you know, look for that little piece of paper <laughs> and be like, wow, I can't believe this mouse wrote this letter. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, it's kind of a combination of all of those things. And what about Norma and Belly? So the Norma and Belly story, those are graphic novels for early readers. So they're the comic format. And those actually started out as a picture book idea. I, I just saw some squirrels in the park on an unseasonably warm day in the winter. And they were going wild. And they had just so much personality. And they reminded me so much of humans. And so... I said I really wanted to make a story about squirrels. And then at the time, we weren't, my agent wasn't sure that we could sell a comic book idea, a comic format idea. So I didn't even bother thinking of it that way. And then we s couldn't figure out how to really write it as a plot for a picture book. So we sort of shelved it. And then maybe like a year later, she said, oh, um, we have a meeting for the graphic novels about the squirrels. And I was like, what graphic novels about the squirrels? <laughs> She's like, you know, the one you were working on last year. Anyways, it's going to be next week. So <laughs> let's get that together. <laughs> so I'm very curious. I think I know the difference, but I would love for you to explain the, the definition of a graphic novel or a comic book as compared to a picture book. Well, the graphic novel allows you a lot more time and moments. Um, so each, you know, it's usually 32 pages for a picture book. And so you have to choose those, you know, key moments that you're going to show in the pictures. Because you only have one picture per page in those books. Exactly. Uh -huh. or sometimes even one picture per two pages if mm. it's a spread, right? Mm. But then with a graphic novel, with a comic format, you can really, you know, create more moments in the page. And so that you can have time to sort of, I think, develop characters mm -hmm. because they have time to breathe and time to, you know, the the little conversational nuances and little bits like that, that you would have to just employ your imagination for in a picture book, the creator can put in themselves in the graphic novel. Yeah. And now you've said that. I mean, that really makes sense because I'm just thinking like, um, Donut Feed the Squirrel. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like conversation between Belly and Norma and then their, their little friend. Is it Little T? Oh, Little B. Yeah, Little B. Little B, little B shaped like a B, like an uppercase oh. B. <laughs> right. Um <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I hadn't really thought of it, but you wouldn't have the time for that kind of conversation that really does express the characters if you just had to move the, the plot along. You, you can have more character development, I guess. 
Yeah, I think so. And um, in Donut Feed the Squirrels, there's a few storylines that are minor. Mm. And it makes the world like a little bit richer. Yeah. Because you can kind of imagine, oh, these other things are going on because it's it's a, wor- a real world and, you know, other people are living in it. Yeah. So wh- I'm curious, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious why you chose to tell stories about animals rather than humans. I mean, there are a few humans in this world, like the adults who control access to the foods that Norma and Belly crave. But those humans for the most part, kind of represent the adversity that the animal characters have to overcome. Why did you focus so much on animals? I think um, one of my favorite things about the animals, like squirrels and cats, is that they live in the same spaces we live in, but they don't use the spaces the same way that humans do, and especially adults do. Mm. So if you're a different size, just because of your physical size, you see these spatial opportunities that you can exploit that other bigger people can't see. And I just really love that idea um, that like the city and the these spaces we live in can mean different things to different creatures. And so that's what I, I really loved about the squirrels is that, you know, they can live in a tree. Like who doesn't want to live in a, in a tree, you know, <laughs> and, and like jump from a tree to the next tree and then jump from that tree into a building. Like <laughs> it's like being a superhero. All right. It's really striking that although these are wild animals, you really get the feeling that these are urban stories. Um, And I wondered whether you were sort of intentionally trying to make stories for city kids. Like, why are they urban stories? And in fact, are they? So I was reading um, a book about the woman who wrote Runaway Bunny. So wait, the the Runaway Bunny was written by Margaret Wise Brown, who also wrote Good Night Moon, that woman? Oh, yes. And then the school that she was working at, they have this whole theory of like the here and the now, um, writing about that instead of writing about fantasy. And and I, I tended to write because I grew up in the Philippines. So I, I tend to write about, in the beginning when I started pitching picture book ideas, I was writing about things that were from my own childhood. Mm. And... I, I when I read that, I kind of realized maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should try writing about the here and the now, like where I live right now. And I live in I live in Queens. I lived in Brooklyn before when I was writing those books, so which is an urban city. And I noticed that people were more receptive to it. Mm. And and it was a different kind of writing. Like it, it, I got ideas more quickly because I didn't have to like go into this memory bank. It was more of just. I would be surprised by the ideas that would come on the street every day or, or like that that sort of thing is very immediate. And so that's what happened with Don't Feed the Squirrels and that series. So I think I'm going to stick to it because <laughs> it kind of works for me for now. Um, yeah. yeah. So some of the individual stories. So you you have, I know there are other characters, but we'll just focus on Norma and Belly. And they are, you know, rambunctious, hungry squirrels. But you've done four of those books now. Can you remember, like, what it was that, like, okay, so this time we're going to be, you know, trying to get pizza. This time we're trying to get uh, fortune cookies. Well, the very first book, Donut Feed the Squirrels, is a donut truck heist. And I used to live on Court Street in Brooklyn. And you might remember this truck because I know it went around. But it's a red donut truck called Carpe Donuts, and they would do just one kind of donut, which was the um, apple cider donut, and it smelled so good on a winter day. And <laughs> and the and the, they, sometimes they would park by my house. My goodness. And so the smell would go up into my window <laughs> while I was trying to work. And then from that second floor window, I also started like imagining – because it's kind of the same height as a squirrel, like on a tree. Uh And so I would see, look down at the tops of cars. And that kind of gave me the idea to, you'll see if you read the book, like (laughs) you'll see how it gave me the idea of like how to get into that donut truck. Um, (laughs) So then it was only just supposed to be that book. So when we got an opportunity to do another book, 
I thought, oh no, (laughs) (laughs) there's a pun in the title and it's about food. And so I kind of set myself up for this like format that's kind of strict. So um, the second one, that one was apple of my pie. And then pizza, my heart, pizza is, is an iconic, you know, New York food. And then um, the last one is one smart cookie. And that one's a fortune cookie. Uh And that origin story is really fun because I was biking by the fortune cookie factory. I didn't know it was a fortune cookie factory. And I biked by it all the time. And uh, so I just would bike by and I would smell it and think, oh, there must be something, you know, that they make nice around here. And then one day I realized while I was biking, I was like, oh, this that's the smell of a fortune cookie. (laughs) And um, I thought, okay, I'm going to put that into my uh, another book if I get to make another one. And so that one, that one was that that way. And then um, I was working on it already and drawing it. And um, sometimes I talked to my father because he lives away. And so he, he called and uh, he was like, "What are you working on?" And I told him I'm working on another squirrel book. And he's like, "Oh well, um, what's the what's the food?" And I said, "Oh, this time it's going to be fortune cookies." And he said, oh, that's really funny. He said, your grandmother's first job when she got out of internment camps was, and she was like, I think 18 or something. Her first real job was working at a a fortune cookie factory typing up fortunes. Oh, my goodness. And just to be clear, that was a Japanese internment camp during World War II in the U.S. That's right. So my grandmother was in Mansonar, and she was a Japanese-American. She grew up in Spokane, Washington, and... Yeah, one day I want to write a story about her. Mm. That's a real fun one. Wow. We'll be right back with more of June's conversation with children's book author and illustrator Mika Song after this. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hey Slate listeners, Isaac Butler here. Thank you so much for listening to our show. I just wanted to say if you're enjoying what you're listening to and you don't already subscribe to the show, why not just click the subscribe button on your podcast app of choice? Not only will you never miss an episode, but it will make it easier for new listeners to find us on whatever fancy algorithm they're using. If you already subscribe and you're thinking, hey, what else can I do to help new listeners find working? Well, there's a couple things you can do. The big one is rate and review the show. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you know, maybe give us five stars. Is that is that too aspirational of me? And if you're really feeling kind, write a short review talking about how awesome we are. If Overcast is your app of choice, you want to give us a star, which is a little complicated press those little three dots right there on your app under the episode and then it will say star at the top and press that star uh if you use another podcast app i don't know how to help you because those are the only two i've ever used but i'm sure you can figure it out you're a smart person how do i know you're smart you're listening to working right now okay uh that's it for me and now back to the episode 
Now, I believe that you work in what I guess you could call an old fashioned way, you know, with analog tools, watercolor and ink on paper. First of all, is that right? And then secondly, why do you choose to work that way? Oh, yes. So I love, love, love ink (laughs) on paper. Even just a drop of ink on paper to me looks like, wow, that looks really good. Um, Just because it's so black and permanent and official looking and very clean almost on white paper. And so that becomes very addictive (laughs) is being able to, you know, see like make a nice dark permanent black line on paper, kind of like when you first get to use a Sharpie when you're a kid. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, wow, I made this dark, dark, bold line. Yeah, it's just very addictive. Um, (laughs) When I first started um, trying to make picture books and writing picture book stories to pitch to um, agents, I was working at an educational website, and my job was all on was using the Flash um, application, which is an animating application, on on the computer. Mm. So all day long, you know, mouse, sti- I mean, stylus, computer, um, and just that. So that when I when I came home, I would work on paper, uh-huh. and it kind of I, you know usually you're tired when you come home, you're drained. So it's like the paper was kind of like a like a fresh start. I realized, yeah. and like a, a, a different headspace. That's awesome. Well, I guess the other part of that is, you know, it pays off because working, writing books for children, there's an element of doing events, you know, with kids. I've seen you do live drawing sessions that are on YouTube. And when you sit there with a big piece of paper in front of a lot of kids and you ask them to tell you what to draw and then show them how to do it, like at that point, you're doing something quite similar to what you do when you originally create the comics, right? Even though there are more spectators there. Uh, So that must be your technique is paying off in those live events in a way. Yeah, I I think it is. Like, and I didn't realize that till afterwards. And I realized, wow, this all kind of works very well together. Um, You know, that I work in this medium already. And then now I get to share that part with people. And it's more, they they can access it easier because that's what... um, when you're in elementary school, you don't go, not, not normally, you don't normally jump right into the um, the computer. You start off with crayons and pencils and paper. And so um, it's still in that in that space for them, which is, it's really nice. So I, I remember going to an event that you did for your first book, Tea with Oliver. <laughs> and I think that so it was your first book. You hadn't done many events like that. Never. Yeah. And... I, again, I saw these these videos uh, that are on YouTube, and you are so confident. You're, you know, when you do the readings, you're, you know, you're dancing. Well, you know, Norma and Belly are dancing, but you're representing that. Wake up! I'm making breakfast. You are? I am. Yes! Pancakes, 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 pan... <laughs> Cakes. I'm curious how you learned to to be more comfortable and to do a kind of more energetic, or I don't know if energetic is the right word, but a more kind of embodied performance in those events. Like, how did what was that evolution like for you? Yeah, so it's true. Like, it I really was kind of shy about talking um, in front of an audience, and the first that first book launch, it was mostly adults. Mm, yeah. And so even now talking to mostly adults is not very fun for me. Like I won't try to do it on purpose <laughs> ever. Like I will, I won't necessarily avoid it, but yeah, um, yeah. basically I do try to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> but I launched my, my book series, my Don't Feed the Strict Girls came out during the pandemic. And so I had to do a lot of video Zooms. Mm. I didn't have to, but I yeah, felt yeah. compelled to try to market my this book that I worked so hard on, mm-hmm. um, all we could do was video. So I would just be by myself recording a video. You know, everyone knows how horrible that is. And then actually having to watch it, which I've heard people tell me to do. They say, you know, like even teachers say, you know, as my teacher training, I would make a video of myself teaching the class and yep. then watch that video mm-hmm. and figure out what I was doing wrong. 
And I would go, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'll try that. And I never, never did that, of course. Um, but then the, the pandemic made me do it. Right. Because I said, I'm not going to send this three minute book talk about my new book without looking at it first to check. Yeah. And um, I think that might have helped me a lot. And then also actually going to do school visits is my favorite thing in the world because um, usually there's just one or two adults and uh-huh. then it's it's the kids and um, they really just want to like, you just want to engage them. And there's all different kinds of kids in the room too. And like, if there's different ways you can reach all those kids, all the yep. kids, that's kind of what I want to do. So I try to vary the program a little bit so that there's a dance number <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a drawing <laughs> section <laughs> and um, there's like a chance for them to draw and it just makes it a much more fun party. <laughs> oh, now just to kind of go back a little bit to the analog nature of your work, I noticed that, you know, there are some translations of your books like La Manzana en la Tarta, No Me Arta. And nice. the Spanish text. <laughs> looks like it's in your handwriting. So is the lettering actually a font? How does that work? Oh, yes. So the graphic designer at the time for Random House Graphic was Patrick Crotty, and he made my font uh, using my handwriting. So Mm -hmm. I would just write um, quick brown fox, quick lazy brown fox, uh, you know, (laughs) jumping over over the about four times. Yeah, yeah, four times in my brush and, and ink. And with all of the punctuations, and then he used some font software to turn it into a font. And that really helped a lot. (laughs) So one thing I wanted to also ask you was, um, I believe you have one child, yes? Yes. Yes. And so you had your daughter during your career as an illustrator and creator of books for children. Did becoming a mom and having a small child in your life change the way you work, change your approach to the stories that you tell? I think it might have just because I it made me be in spaces that are more with more children in them. So uh, normally because I'm not a teacher or I, I didn't really get to interact with a whole bunch of children. So uh, that changed if since I had uh, my daughter. And mm-hmm. so then that helps because, you know, you get to go into the schools a lot and you get to like, you know, meet kids and see what they're interested in. And it does like, I do let it influence like what I'm thinking about, like trying to write about. So, but, you know, before I had her, I used to volunteer as a reading partner. And Uh so that was a way that I could kind of like spy on the children. (laughs) And and if I didn't have her, I would also find another way to... (laughs) <laughs> um, spy on them. Mm-hmm. See what they're like. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. All right. So we talked about your books. Um, you also work as an illustrator of stories that other people have written. How do those kinds of collaborations usually begin? And, and how do you know when a project is one that you want to work on? So, well, I have a, an agent who basically tries to find projects for me to work on or people send um, her things and the way it normally works is that she'll just forward me an email with the manuscript of the writer. And then I read that and either I start to see, you know, you start to see drawings and ideas and characters or or you're like, don't really know, you're just reading a story. So that's basically how I, I decide if I can draw it or not. So in effect, the words are done and then, but like, do you get to think, okay, this is a human child and the palette's going to be blue? I mean, are all those decisions on you or do you work with the author to kind of figure those kinds of things out? No, so you don't work with the author at all. Wow. The editor is the go-between between between the author and the illustrator. So the editor at the publishing house and traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. I think if you become very, very famous, then they let you collaborate with your best friend and come (laughs) in. And I mean, you have to be really, really famous. I think there are a few exceptions, too, with very small presses. Uh I've heard of where people are, they they choose their own illustrator. And um, but it's quite rare. Wow. Um, Traditionally, the editor is the one who chooses the illustrator. Um, You can, as a writer, have some suggestions um, that they would take into account. But that's really their job and also the art director to sort of 
create this this new thing by combining two different creative people's visions. Wow. And then all of the notes get filtered through through the editor. So the 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 author will see the the drawings in progress mm-hmm. most of the time, but you'll never hear directly from the author as an illustrator. So you don't have to really worry about that. It always goes through the editor and gets um, organized and edited. And and so um, hmm. that kind of protects the illustrator from too much stress and too much. And just let them also contribute um, as much as they would normally with without worrying about some, um, tripping on someone else's toes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mika, having watched a couple of YouTube videos that kind of show your live drawing sessions, I immediately wanted to stop everything, go get some supplies, make my own characters and stories. And I have to think that's a universal reaction. So I have two questions. First of all, what art supplies do you recommend that people get to have their own like art play sessions? And also any tips that you have for how people can kind of find stories that they can tell that might engage kids in their life or even other adults? So the best art supply to have for if you're um, wanting to write stories would be a sketchbook Mm. and a small sketchbook. And then you should just try to use it every day, you know, just try to jot down the notes from the day and and just play with it and doodle in it. Um, But it's really just to have this safe space that you have always, that you're always like inputting into. And so you're always working on it. Because like working, if you're a writer, it's like a freelance job, you know, you're not at an office at a desk. Yeah. So you have to have this like space and that's a, that's a sketchbook. So it's private, you know, um, although I, I do show it sometimes, but like it's not really anything to show off about. <laughs> and then yeah. I think for thinking up ideas and finding ideas, I mean, I'm usually really inspired by the world around me. So like I said, with the donut truck and and the squirrels and so just go about your normal day try to maybe get out of the house or sometimes I get inspired by things I see on Instagram too like I see a video video of like like an owl on Instagram and I'm like (laughs) oh I'm I'm gonna write a story about this owl or put this into a book um but yeah and then I I also try to think about people I know and I try to like use ideas from from them to put into stories so I think that if you can put all of those things into the sketchbook, that's a good start. Um, and I usually use a very small sketchbook because I don't. I like to make sure that I I can bring it around and that it's always next to me. If it were very big, I wouldn't use it that frequently. And that looks like it's A five though. You it's, so you're not talking like a a really small. Yeah, not, I mean, I guess yeah, I guess it's A five. It's that um, Midori. I like yeah. their paper because it it works with a fountain yeah, pen. Yeah. Um, Oh, by the way, so the next book that I'm working on is not going to uh, be with a brush. Oh, wait, what? So what's the story there? No, I'm not going to use a brush because the brush was good for the squirrels because um, they're uh. kind of fuzzy and brushy and, and they move around a lot. So mm-hmm. it worked with their movements. Yeah. But so the next book I'm working on is going to be Fountain Pen. Oh, my goodness. What? Wow. I knew you would be interested in oh, this. Yes, yes. So... <laughs> Can you say more or is it, is it? Well, just because it's going to be for uh, kids that are about eight, nine, ten, or a little older than the Donut Feed the Squirrel series. And so mm-hmm. I wanted to change the style just a little bit, um, change the line mm-hmm. just a little bit. And then also there's going to be a lot more interior scenes in, a, in human interiors, which are all straight lines, like, uh-huh. you know, diner uh-huh. scenes and kitchens. And so... Yeah, it lends itself more to being drawn in a in a straight pen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if people want like to get that really cool brush effect, like I know you're moving away from the brush at least for your next series, but that can be a little bit intimidating or or just kind of confusing. Like, how do I do a brush like this? Um, is there any particular tips for getting that kind of brushy, sketchy look that is such a part of like the Squirrel series? So the squirrel characters, they're quite simple to draw. They're just some basic shapes. And so they can, af- they have, they, I, I believe that they afford like a lot of um, messiness. 
and it still holds the integrity of like this is the character. It's two triangles. So essentially, she's a <laughs> she's a squirrel that's two triangles stacked on top of each other. And so as long as you kind of hit those marks, she still looks good. She still looks like her squirrely triangular self. So um, mm. and then the same thing with the watercolors. I don't do tight watercolors, and that's on purpose because. Um, then I can do them a little faster and a little, and and it kind of works with the design. Like she's a squirrel that runs around quickly, so I think doing those over and over again quickly for the graphic novel. And I must have drawn her so many times um, that I can do it like in different strange positions, like turn this way towards a zoom camera or like right. you know on a little notebook on my knee. Um, it just gives you the confidence to draw quickly. Yeah, it has that energy in it. Uh, when you do yeah. it, when you when you do it confidently, even though you're drawing something this small, <laughs> you can pretend <laughs> you're like you're like swashling away with like a big sword. Um, if you do that, then I think it goes into the I think it goes into the drawing. Right. Mika Song, thank you so much for spending time with us, telling us about your creative process. I really love talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, June. When we return, June and I will discuss how to draw inspiration from the here and now, how to get more familiar with the audience for your work, and some tips for everyone's greatest fear, speaking in public. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organise one part of your space and you want to tackle another. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. I've seen a therapist at several points in my life and it has always been incredibly helpful. It really helped me find clarity, improve communication and get a better sense of what was going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash working today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash working. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you. Understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. June, I got to say, I loved this talk. And it's not only because I live near Mika's old address and have definitely thought about robbing that donut truck on occasion. <laughs> uh, the donuts are delicious. I've also bought them. I didn't, I, you know, I, I, uh, do, not, <laughs> not, not condoning theft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, one thing I really loved that Mika talked about was drawing inspiration from the here and now instead of doing things like going to the fantastic or going mm -hmm. deep into your memories. Obviously, I love both of those kinds of things. I'm an avid sci-fi reader. We've talked about how to exploit your memory, but you can draw inspiration from what is right in front of you. Even what you see on your morning commute, if you're still the kind of person who has one of those. I, I'm wondering how you approach drawing inspiration from the here and now, particularly since you're no longer working for a daily news site and yeah. how we can help our listeners who might want to do that. How can we help people find more ways to do it? Well, it's funny that you mentioned daily news because I do feel like maybe I've lost a bit of that mysterious, miraculous alchemy of inspiration because of working in journalism where every day's news is just an opportunity for a take. You know, when Mika saw hyperactive squirrels, she thought children's book, whereas I might interpret them as a cue for a 600 word article on urban environmentalism. And believe me, I would much rather read the graphic novel for kids. So... 
you can kind of lose it, that the joy of inspiration. At the same time, I do think it makes sense that we all translate the raw material we encounter in the world into either cute characters or opinion pieces, depending on our professional needs. All that said, whether we call it inspiration or idea generation, I do think it's incredibly important to constantly be looking around and trying to come up with new things to explore. Even if it's just something for you to consider like as an intellectual project, just be thinking about things or as a source for creative work, it's super important having good ideas, whether it's for books or businesses or for like parties for your kid. It's maybe the most important thing there is, I think. Yeah, you know, and I think just two quickie ways if people are trying to think about that is, you know, when the inspiration strikes you, even if it seems totally ridiculous, like, oh, squirrels, what if they were planning a bank heist? <laughs> just write it down. Just write it down. Yes, yes. And then sometime later, look at the things you've written down and think about them and see what happens, right? And you'll, you'll actually find the more you do that, you will actually develop an idea muscle. And a similar thing with when you have questions. You know, like when you just have questions about something like, oh, that's weird. Why did that song play in three yeah. coffee shops I went to yeah. today or, you know, whatever yeah. it is, uh, you know, just once you write that stuff down, your brain is going to start doing things with it. And so I think yeah. that's a very, very easy uh, way. I was also really happy that you asked Mika about events. The old cliche is that the most commonly held major fear that people have is public speaking, you know, more than shark attacks or their elevator <laughs> plummeting and killing them oh, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and many of us have to do public speaking as part of our jobs, not just talking about book events, but like mm -hmm. talking in a meeting, talking yeah. on a zoom call that has more than two people on it. That's public speaking. You know, I, I have to confess this is not a fear that I have, as you might imagine. <laughs> I get nervous right before I speak in public, you know, right before a meeting, right before a book talk or whatever. Like when I can hear the audience, that's when I get nervous. Ugh. But I have always wanted more attention, not less. <laughs> uh, I loved her advice of recording yourself, even though that's totally mortifying. It's um, better <laughs> to record yourself and then look at it than have someone see that work in public, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So you can study your performance, you can learn learn uh, what you need to do better and to develop kind of talking points. You know, I found once you do a bunch of interviews about a book, for example, like your talking points are kind of generated because you know what questions you're going to ask. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what else you've learned about public speaking, whether it's big meetings at work or the kind of events that we used to do a lot more of here at Slate, uh, what you've learned from how to do it over time. Well, it's funny that you mentioned big meetings at work because You've got to something I've never really quite understood about myself. I've done hundreds of podcasts over the years, dozens of live events, and I never really feel anxious beforehand. I'm very calm, whereas I always felt the nervousness that people describe before, quote unquote, public speaking. When I was going into a meeting, even when it was a team I was comfortable with, I should have felt no jitters about and I don't really understand why I'm calm about speaking off the cuff on a podcast, but not in a meeting. I've really tried to figure it out. And I think what it is about is preparation. When I go into a podcast or a live event, I typically feel satisfied that I'm well prepared, whereas it feels harder to predict what you could do to be ready for whatever might come at you in a business meeting. So I guess in short, though, my answer is preparation. And, you know, preparation can be all kinds of different things. I'm, I'm working when I do an interview, I have my questions prepared, but I want to feel like I'm in control of this topic enough so that I could follow up to an answer, you know, in the moment as it happens on a fully unscripted show like Culture Gab Fest. I always want to feel like I've read enough and thought enough that I'll have an intelligent sounding response when Stephen says my name. But I f just generally feel less stress about that than I did in our weekly team meeting. Right. I bet you have some tips about this, though, Isaac, because I don't think it is just about being naturally extroverted, because as I say, I have that trait too, but it doesn't work in all circumstances. Yeah, I agree with you that a lot of it is preparation. Mm. You know, a lot of it is back when I was an actor, like, do you really know your lines and blocking down cold? Yeah. You know, like, is it really like in your body? in such a way that you don't have to think about it yeah. because then the worries won't start compounding each other. But I, I want to say one other thing, which is that maybe particularly if it's an automatic thing that your body is doing, right? The goal is not actually to not feel nervous, 
but rather to change your relationship to the physical experience of nervousness, right? So I'll give you an example. Like for me, it's my heart starts racing. That's me when I'm nervous. With my wife, her palms get sweaty, you know, or whatever it is. We all have physical cues that we are nervous. If you know what they are, you can just kind of be like, oh, my palms are getting sweaty because I'm nervous. You know what I mean? Like you can just Mm. kind of acknowledge it, not try to crush it, not try to get rid of it, but just acknowledge it and be like, oh, my nervousness is here. Okay, well, I've still got this job to do. I'm going to go do this job. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The weird thing that can happen is your brain can get really locked up with how much work you're doing to not feel nervous as opposed to just being like, hey, my nervousness is one of the things going on right now. Well, just before we move on, I just want to mention another thing that pops into my head, which is. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of talk about alter egos, about how you can kind of develop a persona that you inhabit when you're in a particular situation. So, you know, maybe I have a special kind of June that does podcasts and that person is kind of calm and not too worried about just talking. Right. And maybe there's a specific shirt you wear that signals (laughs) that you're because no, no, I'm serious. You know, costumes are, are very important, you know, um. One trick that a lot of actors do for roles is they buy a private prop that the audience never sees yeah. that they think is key to the character, you know, like a photo the character would keep in their wallet or whatever. And that's a private, almost ritualistic thing that they yeah. feel connects them to the character. And there's no reason why you can't do that for public speaking, too. Yeah. Well, just to uh, to add on to that, there's a, I guess we'll just call him a productivity YouTuber called Ali Abdal. And uh, he recently revealed that He had laser surgery uh, a little while ago, but he still puts his glasses on when he makes videos because that's his YouTube persona. You know, when he puts on the glasses, he's the YouTuber. And so, yeah, people do that all the time. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I mean, a common one for me, if I'm doing book, like I have a book event tonight and I'm speaking to a class and stuff like that. Right. It's like it's always having a blazer or a cardigan on because it just changes your physicality and it loosens your physicality up in this particular way. And so that's always my costume. I don't do that deliberately, but now that we're talking about it, it's like, oh yeah, I always have either a cardigan or a blazer on whenever (laughs) I speak to people, you know? Amazing. I also thought it was really clever that Mika, you know, found a volunteer opportunity that let her spy on children prior to having her own. I mean, that is a great fucking idea. It's a really clear manifestation of this thing, which is just... It's helpful to get to know your audience on some level. What do they respond to? What do they not respond to? Not that you have to always obey that. I'm not saying the market is always right or whatever, but it's just helpful information to have. One of the biggest adjustments for me from directing plays to writing books is that in the former job, you always get immediate direct feedback from just the vibe in the room. Like One of the things you learn to do as a director is to read a room, even if people are silent. You know, you can just tell, are they paying attention? Are they not paying attention? Where is the energy? What's going on? That's amazing. Whereas you write a book, it goes out into the, you know, the world. Maybe it gets reviewed. Maybe it doesn't. You have no idea what people think of it unless they contact you to tell you. And I should say, you know, for the last book, I got many wonderful emails from people. And if you like an author's work, they will always appreciate it if you write them and tell them. And it will always mean a lot to them because because of this very thing. They're like, yeah. who the fuck knows what's happening with this book? Like, even yeah. I could even check the sales figures. That doesn't mean anyone's read it, you know? Right. Um, Slate famously had an incredibly combative, maybe I would even say vicious comment section <laughs> for much of your time there. It's so vicious that there was even a Slate piece written about, like, I rent and engaged with the comments on my work in slate and uh live to tell the tale did, <laughs> did you wade into that world or do you find other ways to get to know your audience well yeah as a slate writer i always had a soft spot for the comments section and you know and it's different too if you're kind of part of an ecosystem like you write regularly for the magazine and so theoretically those commenters have a chance to you know get to know you to establish you know, your good faith and your general point of view before they let rip. Um, Or your vulnerability so they can better believe. Yes, yes, also that, yes. I also think if you're going to write criticism and opinion journalism, you should be prepared to learn from other people's critiques and opinions. You know, what what is that thing? You should be able to take what you hand out or whatever. Again, preferably from people who've actually read what you had to say and are responding to it. 
But when it gets to what you're actually, you know, the thing that was behind your question, Isaac, I'm, I really don't know. Because, you know, as you say, it's hard for writers to get feedback on work in progress, because typically the thing you're getting feedback on is finished by the time you're hearing responses to it. It's not like when you're doing a musical out of town and cutting songs, if they don't go over in Peoria, you get the response when it's too late to do anything about it. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm in that position where my book is, is finished. There's nothing I can do about it. And only a couple of people have read it so far. Uh, and they're my friends. So, of course, they've said nice things. But it's, you know, I don't know how how you kind of predict what response you're going to get. I, I've i kind of looked at things that are similar to mine. You know, what kind of response are they getting on Twitter? But that's silly because, first of all, you know, Twitter's a silly place right now. But also... That kind of rubs away the specificity and individuality of individual people's work. So I don't know. I, I need you to talk me down on this, Isaac. Uh, what can we do? It is hard to get feedback on a work in progress, except from trusted friends or if yeah. you happen to live somewhere that has a works in process reading series or whatever, being involved in that. Right. Mm. But it is useful for speaking in the wider lens arc of one's career to have feedback even on finished work or to think yeah. about like, what does the audience think? This is actually one reason why book events, I know we're only talking about writers here, but there's lots of other <laughs> ways, you know, yeah. but, but doing public events around your work, whether it's published or not, you know, there's plenty of ways to do public events around your work. Even if you don't have a book out, yeah. those kinds of things are really helpful because you get the feedback in the room. Now, some of that feedback is about how good a reader you are, right? But you still get that feedback in the room. You can tell when you've lost a crowd. Like you yeah. can tell when they've stopped paying attention, you've gone on too long. Um, yeah. Or if you can't, that's a sense you need to develop, you know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, the more you can try to find ways to be in touch with what's going on, the better. It is worth seeking out work akin to yours that people seem to be vibing with. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. like, like I write these kind of cultural history kind of things that are for a general audience that also hopefully are rigorous enough that they can be adopted in a classroom. That's kind of the thing I keep trying to do. Right. So like, who are other people who do that in similar fields? Mark Harris is an example, right? Peter Biskind yeah. is an example. Um, Lizzie Goodman, who did the wonderful oral history, meet me in the bathroom about rock and roll in the early 21st century uh, is another example. You know, uh, all these people, the point is not that they sell better than I do, although they do, <laughs> right? It's just like they are making work that is resonating with people. So what are they doing? Those three authors are not similar authors, even though they're in similar yeah. fields. Um, you can just learn a lot from seeking out that work as well. Well, and, and you know, I'm aware there's a, a very active reading series here in uh, in Edinburgh. And there was, you know, I saw that an author's coming up who kind of works in a similar thing. I'm like, I've mm. got to go to that one because yeah, totally. there will be, you know, that's my audience too, I imagine. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, totally. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's show. Thank you so much for listening. I just wanted to take one moment to give you one last Slate Plus pitch. If you go to slate.com slash working plus right now and sign up for Slate Plus, you will get an abundance of goodies, uh, <laughs> full access behind the paywall, bonus segments of shows like this one, bonus full episodes of shows like Dakota Ring, and you will get to support everything we do right here on Working. Go to slate.com slash working plus to sign up today. Thank you to Mika Song for being our guest this week and to our indelible producer, Cameron Drews. Join us next week for Isaac's conversation with Pulitzer winning composer and jazz legend, Anthony Davis. Until then, get back to work.